The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer to peer. What up, buddy? What's going on, man? Hey, what's up, buddy? Good. How you guys doing? Good. Good. Doing good. I um, I can't help myself here. Anyone use FreeBSD out there? If there's anyone that uses FreeBSD, you know, hit a like out in the comments or, or something like that. Um, I always joke that um, Monero is like the free BSD and Bitcoin is like Linux. Uh, free BSD is very, it's not used nearly as much, but it's extremely powerful in a lot of ways. Like, for example, Netflix runs all of their server back in with free BSD. I remember hearing about that. That's super cool. Yeah, it's an interesting system. It's um, it, The difference between the ecosystems is that, and this is like such a good comparison, Whereas Linux is a bit uh, sort of fractionated, there's a bunch of different little ecosystems, right? You've got the kernel development, you've got um, GNU, which is kind of like your user space, and, and you've got uh, GNOME, you've got a whole bunch of different parts of the ecosystem that are kind of like, mm, they're, they're a little bit fractured. They're not like totally cohesive, which is why you have so many Linux distributions. Whereas FreeBSD is kind of developed as a single unit together in lockstep. So like, you don't get these crazy regressions that break stuff. Um, and, and it's just generally a little bit more, it's a little bit more cohesive of an operating system. It's, it's actually even more stable in my experience than Linux. Um, but fewer people use it, fewer people know about it. Not, too, cool. different, not too different than Monero versus Bitcoin. All right, what do we got for, what do we got for price this week? Another kind of week in the doldrums, right? Not much more. I've, I, I guess actually we did see some, negative action for Monero, given the, the delisting. Yeah, I guess that's really, for us, that's the big story. If we just go straight to uh, to Monero here. Uh, this is the weekly chart. I always like this weekly chart. It's it's a clean chart, right? We've got our, our bear market here. We've got our broader rising triangle. Uh, but if we go down to the daily, yeah, we can see where, um, you know, we got, we got hit a little bit with some price action to the negative side. But, I mean, what is that? Down 7% after a delisting. Um, I mean, you guys were around for 20 21 when bitrex delisted and even though they do no volume and they don't matter it was just like the social hit that mattered more than anything um so i guess uh you know we kind of have to concede this one a little bit to to the guys on reddit for years we're saying that monero is going to get banned in europe particularly was one of their big um contentions and i actually kind of you know i resisted that personally for a while uh, and then they were like, well, okay, it might not get, crim we, we kind of came to a balance where they said it might not get criminalized, but it'll still get banned off exchanges. And I kind of had to be like, yeah, you guys might be right. Um, so it looks like that, yeah, that's actually happening. But at this moment, I don't think that any of us are really crying any tears over this. Um, the sooner this happens, rip the bandaid off. And I mean, let's find other ways of, uh, of getting into and out of Monero. It'll actually just make the decentralization of our ecosystem stronger, in my opinion. Um, but we are kind of like, so you can see down here, we are basically flirting again with, um, with this, uh, this lower line. We'll go back to the weekly really quick, just, just so that you guys can make sure and have perspective on uh, why that, that uh, thick white line here at the bottom is drawn the way it is. Oh, and if you're on the spaces, um, definitely tune into YouTube so you can see the charts. And uh, all the guys after me have really cool presentations uh, and graphics. So definitely worth getting on YouTube uh, to watch this as well. But okay, so yet I digress. So that thick white line is kind of like came from, you know, it's, it's basically years in the making here. And um, it looks like we're oops, looks like we're probably going to end up touching that. Um, so but I mean, realistically, like, is this is this the worst that some big delistings across Europe can do? Right. In, in all of France. Was it Germany, France? And there was it Germany. I, I don't remember which countries. Uh, I, I think guess, it's uh, France, Italy, Poland. Uh, I don't know what else we have. We have a couple of people from France that are going to be jumping on to give us their their take, which should be cool. Cool. Yeah, those guys will have the details on that. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just the price monkey over here. <laughs> okay, so, so let's go to uh, let's go to the Dixie because uh, I mean, again, you know, macro. I love macro. I, I, we got to keep our broad focus. You don't want to lose track of the broad focus. And by now, these charts should be pretty familiar to you guys. Um, so last week we talked about this was being, you know, this was kind of a um, uh, a reasonable point to expect that we could get some resistance here for the dollar index uh, for two reasons, right? Because on the local, more local level, we've got this line. And then on the slightly broader level, we've got that other line as well. And they were kind of intersecting, converging here. Now, this to me is like where we're at here for the dollar index is kind of an inflection point. Um, 
it's natural to expect that, okay, so after this kind of, you know, drop here, we, we had a little bit of divergence um, on the on the Z scores, on the momentum indicators, right? Uh, dollar index is going up, momentum indicators were already in a downtrend, that signaled that we'd get a reversal. But what can happen with these things often is that um, just because it's kind of in a downtrend here doesn't mean that it can't stop. Um, this is the kind of opportunity where the dollar index would, would have the opportunity to kind of do this action and then do this and then eventually break to the upside. And that would be a pretty negative sign actually for risk assets in general. It doesn't correlate one-to-one -one necessarily, but um, if dollar index really shows us some continuing strength here, um, we, we will definitely start looking at uh, whether it's time to um, really exit these markets and, and wait for a better setup. Um, we can see that gold, uh, because you know the dollar index um, pulled back, that's where we got a little bit of action here to the top side, but then you know dollar index rebounded. So gold seems very inversely correlated to dollar index lately, along with crypto. Crypto has been surprisingly inversely correlated. Uh, we've got our reverse repos, and um, you know this thing is is mostly just stable and sideways. Uh, I would and, until we get some other indication, I, I'm just going to take this chart as sort of a corroborating continuation chart. Uh, like maybe if this breaks down and starts heading towards the downside, that could that could signal the potential for more upside in uh, in markets. Particularly, what we're looking at lately is the stock market is um, is really just continuing to rip, right? It's continuing to make a big run. Um, the Nasdaq, for example, has already beaten its August highs, well beaten its August highs, and this is this right here is the last remaining peak before the all time high in the Nasdaq. So that's that's interesting that stocks have really continued to perform. And um, ironically, the digital gold is actually performing in a way that seems to be congruent to gold lately, maybe as of the past couple months. So like gold is just kind of sideways, not doing so great, whereas stocks are just going up. Uh, and that's a very common thing that you'll see um, once the stock market gets going, people will lose their interest in gold. Um, but realistically, I mean, come on, like, at, like since the bottom here, gold is still up by 20%, which for gold is, you know, it's a pretty big move. Um, and, and the chart overall still looks fine. Take a quick look at oil here. Uh, essentially, it's just sideways, right? And this is, again, what you want to see. Um, I think this is intentional. This is purposeful. You, you don't want to see big oil prices. Uh, if you want to see the economy continue to recover and you want to see stocks have the potential to keep going up, you want to see stable oil prices. So... Uh, that's that. Let's take a look at the, the Bitcoin market cap added to the Ethereum market cap. I think that's the way to, um, that's an important way to, to think about things um, going into the future. And we're basically, there was um, there was a little bit of hoopla earlier this week that uh, people thought, hey, hey, we're breaking out here. Um, you know, the, the, we're, we're breaking the resistance and I kind of, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I wasn't really convinced. Um, because, you know, there's a few different ways to draw lines and okay, it looks like maybe we were breaking here. Um, I even saw a line drawn kind of like this, you know, and I was like, yeah, kind of, sort of, you almost could say that. Um, but so many times you've got multiple lines that you've got to break the resistance multiple times. Anyways, um, this chart doesn't look so bad to me, though. Honestly, like there's still plenty of potential for Bitcoin um, and Ethereum and Monero to uh, to make more upside action here. I know it's been slow. I know it's been um, it's been difficult, but we'll, we'll get a little bit more into crypto in a second here. Uh, the Federal Reserve balance sheet has continued to drop. We're, we're basically almost back at the levels we were before the banking crisis. Um, what is that? Eight point four trillion, three, four. Yeah. So we're wow. OK, so we're really only like 40 billion dollars if my math is right there. We're only $40 billion from basically everything back being back to normal after the banking crisis. Um, let's see, yields. Uh, we continue to see yield curve inversion. Um, we thought, hey, you know, could this be the big one? Are we going to start doing that? And, you know, and yield curve is correcting and it's, it's time for the big one. Nah, yield curve just went back down. Um, let's see, we, uh, we do see yields continue to slowly... But they're stable and slowly rising. The Federal Reserve Reverse Repo Lending Facility is probably designed to do exactly this, right? Why would you get a long-term yield at low rate when you could just get pure liquid cash and a higher yielding reverse repo if you're an institution? So people don't want these longer term yields. The rates ultimately have to go up to match because they're selling those, right? People don't want to be in them. You have to offer a more attractive interest rate. So the rate has to go up on the secondary market for those. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, still just kind of stability. Uh, let's take a look at the at the S&P real quick. So the S&P is currently about to contend with the August peak um, back uh, back last year. 
So the S&P still has a ways to go. And we can take a look at the ratio of the NASDAQ to the S&P. So as this goes up, that means the NASDAQ is doing relatively better than the S&P. Right here, there's some really big statistical levels that I look at, um, some standard deviations that uh, are likely to, to place a significant limitation here. That doesn't mean it has to reverse immediately. Like, you know, we've seen this where it could kind of just meander on down. So it is, there's a good chance that the S&P will actually um, make better gains on the NASDAQ or relatively compared to the NASDAQ. Um, potentially is if it can get over this area right here. Uh, we'll have to see, but I mean, stocks, like I said, stocks just continue to perform. Um, and I mean, why, the cabal doesn't want you to buy crypto or gold. They want you in stocks, right? So I do think that there is, there is some influence and pressures that try to, that try to make sure that this kind of action happens. Uh, let's see crypto as a whole. Oh, one thing I promised I'd show you guys this week is, um, is the adjusted regression analysis. So the regression that I had done previously, uh, where did my, here's my brush. Um, so the regression I had done previously um, only took the data from like here backwards, right? Um, and so, but we had like, we had an entire year of bear market now and I wanted to integrate this data into the yellow line, um, right? Because we're we're looking at uh, extra bear market data now that, that could be useful for us. So the orange line down here is basically the, um, like the lowest lower boundary of the Bitcoin price. And then the yellow line is if you just exclude all of these blow off tops here, just get rid of all that data. And there's kind of a, an algorithmic methodical way that you do that. Um, but essentially it's the non, the yellow line is the non bubble Bitcoin price. To me, it, it's kind of like represents something more akin to the fair value price of Bitcoin. Um, you know, these, the, these peaks up here, these are like leverage blow off fraud, bullshit kind of stuff, right? Hype cycles. Um, and they don't really represent real price. They just represent the opportunity for whales to dump their bags on unsuspecting plebs, uh, which is, you know, we don't want to we don't want to be those plebs. We want to be the guys that understand, you know, what dynamics are happening in the background. So you can see um, you can see back here uh, in 2015, 2016, we kind of just like slowly rode this line up and down, up and down. And it wasn't until we got right here, right where the where the yellow line, where the fair value actually crosses the previous blow off top is when we finally shot up and it we actually we shot up a little bit earlier um, this past time you can see that we only really just now as of i said just now but last year somewhere around uh, july um, where the fair market value or the non-bubble uh, regression of bitcoin actually reached twenty thousand. and this was kind of another reason why for such a long time i said that you know we have to go back to twenty thousand. like this the heights we're at don't make sense um but at any rate my guess is that over the next year, maybe maybe two, maybe even all the way into 2025, we can probably expect something very similar as we saw 2015, 2016. Um, so I, I do think it's very possible that at some point we'll come touch the uh, the red line down here. We'll have to wait and see on that. You might be able to consider this close enough. Maybe, maybe. Uh, we'll, we'll see. But anyways, that's what the regression looks like. Um, the, at least the yellow line looks like after adjusting for the recent um, bear market that we've had. Um, and who knows, maybe could still be could still be in. Uh, let's see, I just wanted to cover shit coins a little bit too. So we've got total crypto market cap minus Bitcoin and Ethereum. So it's basically um, all the shit coins and also Monero is in, included in this. Um, I hope you guys see what I did there. Okay, so uh, we've got, uh, we've, we've got kind of like this line right here. And uh, it, this has kind of been like a bit of a capping line. You could almost try and make the case that this looks a bit like a head and shoulders, although that's kind of a gimpy uh, short shoulder. It should more be over here, um, but it, it's possible. Like we, we could see another run up here. I'm not really so confident, like how long this can continue. Um, I'm starting to get, you know, a little bit antsy about is, is you know, are we getting close to a top? I, I still think that it's worth saying in the market, um, you know, it, we're still kind of like the expectation over the next year or so is that we should trend up on that um, on that fair value line like we showed for the regression just a, a little bit ago. Um, you know, shit coins are kind of a different story. You got to be careful with these guys because they can continue going down for even even after Bitcoin's bottom, they can continue going down for months. But, you know, if you see this line get broken, um, that that could be a sign that you could see a big shit coin bounce. And honestly, seeing a big shit coin bounce to me um, could could be a sign of a of a reversal, right, of a, of a top, of an imminent sort of uh, interim top um, in, in kind of like a months long time frame. So uh, and finally, uh, let's go to Monero. And uh, we've got uh, Monero Bitcoin ratio. 
Okay. Yeah, here we go. Uh, Monero Bitcoin ratio, familiar chart, uh, sort of the lifetime chart. Uh, with with the action that we've seen with the delistings uh, in Europe, it, it's actually really interesting that we're still basically holding that same level. Like that that hasn't really been a, a big deal for the ratio uh, for Monero to Bitcoin. So, um, you know, there's also another thing to consider about Monero right now is that um, they just released, and I think our news guys will get into this, but they just released the the proof of work solution so that you have to bid for bandwidth or bid for connections when it gets saturated, when Tor gets saturated, you have to actually bid for those connections using a proof of work mechanism. Um, and that should hopefully end the big DDoS against Tor. Um, <laughs> Now, okay, so I'm not like, I, I mean, I, I think that some some drugs are okay. I don't want to like be making moral statements here. I'm not sure like it is, you know, is the dark webs like really the thing we want to be like, yeah, all right, our price is going to go up because people are buying drugs again. But maybe they're just buying life-saving insulin. You know, I, I don't know, right? It's, it, it could just be trying to get around the, uh, the corporatism in the United States. But at any rate, um, with that happening, there is, I think, a potential that Monero could actually perform. Um, one thing that we've seen, I thought was very interesting. So uh, this dotted line, the vertical dotted line here, is um, that was where we left off last week. And you can see that the price divergences for all of the exchanges were basically above the zero level. They were doing volume uh, at at price divergences that were above Kraken's price. But if we undo the volume adjustment, we're going to end up seeing that they still, like even if even without the volume adjustment. They just like kept their prices overall higher than Kraken for that entire week, which is very unusual because usually what we see with their price divergences is that the, the actual like the actual um, price relative to Kraken will sort of oscillate around the zero. But then when you make the volume adjustment, you'll see that they're doing lots of volume in one direction. It's kind of lopsided. Um, maybe that's an obfuscation mechanism on their part. I don't know. But at any rate, we, um, we we're kind of back to normal now. But I do think it was interesting that that it does look like they purposefully put and kept their prices higher than Kraken in the week leading up to this delisting. And it's not like Binance was like, oh, my God, we should delist tomorrow. Like, this is something they've been planning. So, uh, you know, I do kind of have a I do kind of wonder if um, like if they know something that we don't. And this is totally speculative. Like, you can't even make a, a, a hypothesis on this, really. But. Is it possible that they know that there's more delistings coming? They're actually trying to accumulate Monero. Like, do we have negative price influences that are even more negative than we thought? And it's actually guys like Binance and Polo and whoever are actually buying Monero right now. And they're stocking up knowing that it's, you know, that it's going to be hard to get. And I mean, I don't know. You could probably go a lot of different directions with that. But at any rate, the um, the price divergence. I like, that, I like that theory. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well... I like it. I don't like it, right? Because what are they going to do with that Monero? Are they going to dump it on the market when it's time for bull market again? Yeah, it's it's a double edged sword. Well, I mean, they're they're not going to be dumping it on the market, right? Because they're no longer listing. <laughs> you know, maybe maybe they'll get into the uh, the atomic swaps game, um, and uh, who knows? Who knows? Right? Yeah, they'll they'll pump the price of Monero somehow, or then um, eventually relist it or something. Maybe. Right, they'll go fight some legal battles. Who knows with those guys, right? They're just schemers. It's, it's all they <laughs> their Although hands rubbing they together. Give them more credit than they're due, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, it's pretty hard to scheme on that on that that level. Yeah, I mean, they we shouldn't underestimate them. No doubt, it's like they are pretty smart guys. Uh, at least some of them, right? It's kind of like the Federal Reserve and the government. Like, yeah, they're. I mean, we don't like them necessarily for all the fraud that's taking place, but hey, don't don't underestimate your enemy. That's a mistake. Well, I mean, I think the, the the narrative of them selling paper Monero and that it's like the end of days for that, that, that makes sense to me, right? Um, what do you think? Do you think that's going to have a real effect that there will we'll be less and less paper Monero out there? Huh. Yeah, you know, maybe that could be it too. Maybe they know that they plan on delisting, so they're going to have to pay a bunch of people real Monero. Maybe they're trying to accumulate to make those payments and not look like mm -hmm. assholes. <laughs> you know, that, that's We could go that direction potentially. Um, I do think that their games of Paper Monero are ultimately coming to an end. Um, it just seems like this stuff takes a lot longer, you know, than we might have originally hoped. But that's okay, you know. Let's so should, should we, I mean, in theory, we should see uh, a reaction in price, right? If our, if our Paper theory, our Paper Monero theory is correct, 
and now like Binance no longer listing Monero. I don't know if, if the ball is going to drop with other exchanges. We should start to see less downward price pressure, right? If paper Monero was a real thing. Yeah, I think that that would make sense, but only only if um, Binance in particular, and maybe Qcoin as well. It seems like they've been doing more um, more action lately. But yeah, I mean, if they're if they start delisting in more and more jurisdictions, um, that could be the case. I, we we really have to see, right? Because so far, these few countries probably don't represent a significant amount of volume or a significant amount of paper Monero. Um, so you know, the United States, Canada, um, maybe. I don't know. Maybe I'd have to go look and, and try and like track this down and do the research. But yeah, I mean, if we see Binance delist Monero in, is it the United States? No, it's not the United States, just gen just generally. Like if Binance delist is generally speaking, then okay, like, um, yeah, we should we should see um, positive price action and kind of price floors. I mean, there'll be volatility though, like, because the, the, the delisting, people are going to be like, oh my God, they're going to panic, right? They're going to sell. So we'll see downside pressure, but then ultimately you'll see like a wick down and, and price will come back up. But yes, I, I think right. ultimately if we see broad delistings along this lines and this continues, then yes, we should see the sort of end of the paper Monero suppression. All right. So uh, let's see, here's our Monero dominance. I don't know, not, not really anything too exciting with this chart. Uh, maybe kind of forming a bottoming pattern, maybe even forming a very big head and shoulders, right? Like hypothetically, if that comes back to the top side, uh, that would definitely be a head and shoulders. Uh, yeah, so okay. Oh, Monero versus Ethereum. Yeah, we're kind of, I don't know. It's uh, it's not looking good to me. Uh, some of these statistical levels I look, le uh, look at, it looks like Monero might lose a little bit of ground to Ethereum and find a bottom somewhere around in the, maybe this area. Um, but maybe we get lucky. Uh, it, it's kind of like it's hard to it, it's really hard to say because if Monero recovers against Ethereum and Bitcoin and other coins, we need either a fundamental event that drives that or um, that means that the, the bear market is going to come back for, for a moment and try and swipe down. Uh, so, yeah, that, this chart doesn't look great is, is all I'm really getting at. So, um, but, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to hobble. That's what you're going to do. Buy more. <laughs> exactly. So all of your Ethereum and your Bitcoin and also your dog coins. <laughs> With dog coins, which are up to 2 million transactions per day now. Oh, wow. I think what? Elon Musk had a meeting with um, the very large group of dog coin developers. And, uh, <laughs> and I think they decided to um, pump up their, their numbers, you know, get those numbers up. Yeah, wow. 2 million per day, <laughs> right. That's that's impressive. Okay, interesting. See, the, the thing is that these guys have they have every incentive to pad their blocks. Like if you're a mining pool, if you're a solo miner, you know whatever, and you you win a block, you have every reason to pad that block um, to try and make it look like there's more transactions, make it look like there's more demand for block space, so that you can get higher fees. Um, they all of these guys have every single incentive to do this, but Monero doesn't have that incentive because of dynamic blocks. If you pad the blocks everyone's going to be paying slightly less in fees anyways, right? Um, and if you like, so you could hypothetically try and pad 100 blocks beforehand to make it look like there's demand. Um, and then the block sizes start going up, but then people start paying less in fees. So you're actually losing on that. So Monero's dynamic blocks prevent like fakery on the blockchain, prevent fakery by the miners, whereas none of these other proof of work coins have a mechanism to do that. To that end, we have. It looks like we have Arctic Mine that's uh, here today. That's awesome. So hope hey, what's up? Too. Maybe we could ask him about that uh, if he if he agrees with that theory. But it sounds sounds pretty accurate. Uh, sounds truthy. I could represent it. Maybe I'm wrong. It's probably a lot more math involved than the way I make it sound. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I will never understand the Elon Musk thing of him you know, glomming on to Dogecoin and deciding to just randomly out of nowhere you know, pump it and stick with it, right? Like that, that will never compute with me. Like why? Why Dogecoin, right? Like Mr. Mr. Liberty, Mr. Free Speech Purist, uh, you know, glosses over something like Monero and decides to assist Dogecoin to the moon. Makes no sense to me. Well, he likes memes and he likes dogs. I guess as simple as that. He's just a yeah, <laughs> fun-loving guy. <laughs> all right well uh, i think that's about all i got for you guys today and unless you had any questions 
Uh, no, man, that's good. That's great. Yeah, let's keep moving because uh, we have a bunch of guests. We have uh, a couple of people that are from France that want to talk about their experience with the delisting and what they're going to do. I have a feeling it's going to be the response is going to be that they don't care and they're going to continue to use Monero, but it'll be great to hear from them. And it looks like we have Arctic Mine that's going to jump on. Mm -hmm. here, so that well, my tip of my hat to the, uh, to the resistance happening in France, they're on the front lines and um, hopefully they can show us how it's done. Yeah, for when, for when it comes here. Uh, thank you so much, buddy. Yeah, stick, or, stick around if you can. Uh, maybe you could interact with Arctic a little bit. That would be awesome. Cool. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, I'll be around.